Okay, we're definitely not gonna go outside to film today. But we can talk about the seven big mistakes beginner filmmakers make. There's no condemnation here. I've made all these mistakes, but I thought I would share these mistakes because then maybe you don't have to make the same mistakes because you can learn from my mistakes and other beginner filmmakers' mistakes. How does that sound? I think that sounds pretty good compared to going outside in this rainy weather. Not today. We're not going out today. Mistake number one that beginner filmmakers make is that they spend all their money on their camera bodies but they neglect their lenses. I personally was guilty of this and many other beginner filmmakers, maybe even you who's watching right now, are guilty of this. You've spent all your money on your camera body but then you don't have a lot of money so you just go with the basic kit lens or the other mistake I see often is that people spend all their money buying some crazy telephoto lens and they're so happy because they've got all their focal lengths covered Meanwhile, they don't realize that they actually don't have a good lens at all. Now, in my opinion, the best lenses to invest in the beginning are prime lenses. Prime lenses have fixed focal lengths like 25 millimeter, 35 millimeter, 50 millimeter, 85 millimeter, and so on. And for some people, they might complain like, well, that's just one focal length. What are you gonna do when you need to zoom in or zoom out? And like I said earlier, I think the great part about prime lenses is that it actually forces you to move around and get more creative shots. But as well, the great part about prime lenses is that they have really low apertures. For example, this is a 50mm 1.2, meaning it's gonna get you a really shallow depth of field and it's gonna give you that nice bokeh, plus you're gonna be able to shoot in low light conditions. Now, this is a very expensive lens, so in the beginning, I'm not expecting you to go out and buy a 50mm 1.2 lens, but you can buy, for example, a simple 50mm 1.8 lens, which probably will cost you a few hundred dollars, but that lens is gonna be able to get you really sharp footage and as well get really nice shallow depth of field, which really steps up the game when you're shooting with your camera. So when you're starting out, sure, buy a nice camera body, but make sure you still have enough money to buy a lens that's actually gonna allow you to get the full potential out of your camera body. Because there's no point in buying a really expensive camera and then having a basic kit lens. Mistake number two is blaming your camera when actually it's you who's at fault because your camera settings suck. I often get a lot of comments on my YouTube channel where people are saying, how do you get your footage to look so good and so sharp? And they're wondering what's going on because they have the exact same camera. And most likely people are harboring some bitterness and resentment towards their Sony a7S III or Canon 60 Mark II because they're just not getting the quality and image that they're hoping for out of their camera. But it's actually not your camera's fault it's you and your settings. But don't you worry, with a few small steps, we can get that fixed. So let's start with the basics. First thing, frame rates. When you're shooting with your camera, if you wanna have that nice cinematic look, shoot at either 24 or 25 frames per second. Now, this depends on whether you're in North America or Europe, it has something to do with the broadcast and flickering of the lights. But basically, if you live in North America, use 24 frames per second, and if you're in Europe, use 25 frames per second. Now, for some people, when they first see 24 frames per second, they might think, ah, oh, that doesn't look so sharp or smooth. But you actually wanna have that nice motion blur, and that's the frame rate that all Hollywood films are filmed in. You don't wanna use 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second, unless you wanna do slow motion of course, but if you want just basic, good-looking cinematic footage, use 24 frames per second. And when you're shooting 24 frames per second, you wanna always double your shutter speed, so if you're shooting at 24 or 25 frames per second, have 50 shutter speed. This is gonna give you the ultimate looking motion blur for your footage and just the best cinematic look coming out of the camera. So 24 frames per second, shutter 50, and then from there, we're gonna choose our ISO. Now, each camera has its own base ISO, and essentially what that means is that when you use the base ISO, it's gonna give you the maximum amount of dynamic range and quality to your footage. Now, the Sony a7S III, for example, has a dual base ISO of 640 and 12,800 when you're shooting in log. So basically, I'm always shooting at ISO 640, or if it's not enough light, I'll boost it all the way up to 12,800 right away. I'm not even gonna bother with ISO 1600, 3200, 6400, because the 640 and 12,800 are much cleaner. 
Now, the base ISO can differ for all cameras and not all cameras have a dual native ISO, which means they don't have two base ISOs. So figure out what is your camera's base ISO and whether or not it has dual native ISO. So I'm shooting 24 frames per second, 50 shutter speed, ISO 640 or 12,800 always. From there, then I choose my aperture and I like to shoot from anywhere from 1.4 to 2.8 aperture to get the nice shallow depth of field when I'm filming. If with those settings, it's just way too bright, then grab a variable ND filter. This is just a filter that you can put on your lens. And as you turn it, it's gonna get brighter or darker. So with this tool, then you can expose your shot right while maintaining that shutter 50 when you're shooting at 24 per second and having a low aperture like 1.4 to 2.8. Okay, so we've got 24 frames per second, shutter speed 50, shooting with an aperture between 1.4 to 2.8 having your ISO at whatever your camera's base ISO. So for me, the Sony a7S III, I'm shooting at 640 or 12,800. And then last, I'm gonna choose to shoot with a log picture profile. Now, if you're wondering what does shooting in log mean? Well, basically it's just a picture profile in your camera that shoots the footage at a very desaturated and uncontrasty look. Now for beginners, I, it looks terrible and it's true. It doesn't look as good as the normal footage coming to your camera, but the reason why you shoot in log is because you're gonna get the max amount of dynamic range in your footage. It's gonna preserve the highlights and the shadows, the detail there, and as well, you're gonna have more flexibility in post to color grade. Whereas if you shoot with just the basic standard picture profile, it's gonna already bake into your footage, the contrast and sharpening, and there's not gonna be that much room to color grade, and as well, you're not gonna have that same dynamic range. It can seem a little bit daunting at first when you're shooting log, wondering, how do you get it back to that nice Rec 709 look, which basically just means having contrast and saturation added again, but they've actually made it really easy for you guys nowadays. Most camera manufacturers actually offer a conversion LUT, which will take the log footage into a Rec 709, which just means adding contrast and saturation again, or you can just do it on your own. So often I would just take the log footage, then I would add just a curves to add contrast back into it, and then saturation and voila, you have it color corrected from a log picture profile to a Rec 709 look. So make sure if you want the best looking footage coming out of your camera, shoot in the log. Yes, it is one extra step in your process, but you're not gonna regret it when you see that cinematic footage coming out of your camera. All right, mistake number three that beginner filmmakers make is overestimating their camera gear and underestimating lighting. Most people, when they start their filmmaking journey, they spend a whole lot of time, energy, and money on camera gear like cameras and lenses and all that sort of stuff, but they neglect lighting. Light is essential if you wanna get a good looking image out of your camera. It's like gas for a car engine. You're not gonna go very far without it. And that's the same for cameras. If you don't have good light, you're not gonna get a good image out of your camera. I mean, just look at this setup right now. Let me turn off the lights right now. This is my key light and my backlight. This is what my image would look like without lighting. It's kind of crappy looking. But then I add my atmosphere backlight, I add my key light and voila, it looks a whole lot better because of lighting and not because of the camera. So that's why as a beginner filmmaker, it's really important that you invest time and money into learning about lighting. So the first thing you gotta understand about lighting is that the time of day affects the look of the light. For example, if you go out and shoot in the middle of the day in the harsh afternoon sun, it's gonna look a whole lot different than when you go out during sunset in golden hour. In the middle of the afternoon, the lighting's gonna be a lot more harsh and not pleasing to the eye on your subject, whereas if you go shoot during sunset, it's gonna be a lot more golden and soft looking. Or if you're looking for that nice cinematic moody look to your footage, stay after the sunset and shoot during blue hour to get a whole different look. So the time of day that you're shooting at is gonna have a dramatic impact on the look of your footage. The second thing you gotta understand is distance to lighting. So basically, the closer the light is to you, the softer it looks. Right now I have this huge softbox really close to my face, whereas if I had it all the way in that corner, it's gonna look a lot more harsh. Third thing you gotta learn about lighting is how to balance it. For example, if I was doing this shot without any atmosphere backlight like this, you know, everything just goes really dark behind me. A lot of people, when they buy a light, they just blast the light. You know, I could even put this higher right now like this, and they just blast light, then they adjust the exposure to for the skin, and all of a sudden the background goes even darker. That's why you wanna have, you know, this backlight 
Gonna increase a little bit, again, to just balance it. You wanna have the key light and your atmosphere light balanced together so you get a nice, even lighting. Oh gosh, this is way too bright. Let's bring it down. Put the shutter to 50 again. That looks pretty good. And then backlight darker. That looks good again. Mistake number four is either not licensing your music or just paying way too much for it. When I first started in the filmmaking world, I was shooting a lot of weddings. And because I wanted to do things the right way, I licensed all of the music for every single one of my wedding films. And each license would cost anywhere from 100 to $300, which meant that when you're shooting anywhere from 30 to 40 weddings a year, you're spending thousands of dollars on music licensing. That is until Artlist came along. If you're new to the filmmaking world and you wanna license great high quality music for a very affordable price, I would highly recommend checking out the sponsor of this episode, which is Artlist. Artlist literally has thousands of high quality songs that you can use for a very affordable price of only $9.99 if you're a social media content creator or $16.90 if you're creating projects for companies and client work. That's right, for a low price of $9.99 or $16.99, depending on what kind of work you're doing, you're literally getting access to licensing thousands of high quality songs for all of your projects. And I've been creating a lot of YouTube videos so far in my journey. I think I just hit 400 videos on this channel and I haven't ran out of music yet. So. That's a sign that there's a lot of great music to be used on Artlist. And with that subscription, not only do you get access to thousands of high quality songs, but as well access to their whole sound effects library, which is huge in the sound design process. You can literally go write any different kind of sound effects you're looking for, download and throw it into your timeline. All of a sudden, all your motion graphics in different scenes are just coming alive because of your sound effects. And with Artlist, you can easily find the right song for your project. For example, you can search by mood and figure out what feeling you want for your project. Or you can search by theme, whether the video is for you know a commercial or for weddings or documentaries. There's different songs that have been allocated through these different kinds of video themes. Or you can choose by music genre. You can search for ambient or acoustic or folk or electronic, whatever you're looking for for your project. And if you wanna get really specific, if you're looking, for example, for a specific instrument in a song, you can even choose something like whistling if you wanna have that nice catchy whistling tune in one of your folk songs. Having the ability to search for music with all these different options really speeds up the process because I at least know that in the past I spent hours finding the right song. So if you're a beginner filmmaker, don't make this mistake and not license your music or pay way too much. Instead, check out Artlist. They've actually been kind enough to offer a two month free discount using the link in my description, so check that out. Mistake number five is limiting your toolkit. I don't know about you, but I am sometimes a dinosaur and I'm slow to learn new things and I don't like adapting and getting used to change. Sony videographers just stick to one camera, one lens. It's the setup that they're used to and they don't try anything else. And yes, it is good to get comfortable and consistent with your setup, but as well, it's good to diversify and continue learning new tools so that you keep growing. So tools like learning how to film with an Insta360 or flying a drone or take it a step further, learning how to fly an FPV are all great examples of tools that you can learn to use to diversify your toolkit. For me, initially, there's always that awkward stage where you don't really wanna learn this new tool because you're not good at using it. But once you start using it and all of a sudden you get more comfortable, all of a sudden you realize that you've actually learned and grown a lot and you're a lot more diverse as a videographer. Just by practicing and shooting, for example, with Insta360, I've unlocked a whole new world of doing creative shots or filming action sports. I've learned how to film with the Insta360, how to get the best possible footage out of it, how to track and export in the program, all these steps that I've learned because I've just taken the step to not limit myself and learn how to use a new camera. Or learning how to fly a drone. It's totally opened up a whole new world of epic cinematic shots that back in the day, you literally would need a helicopter for in order to get. Or learning how to fly my FPV drone. A, it's been just a whole lot of fun, but B, it's gonna hopefully open up a door for me to get those epic swooping shot along a mountain or flying down a waterfall eventually. I'm still not quite there, but I still need to learn and grow to get there, but eventually I will. If I only ever stuck to my Sony a7S III and just shot with this setup only, I would limit myself so much and I never would have learned how to use all of these other tools. So 
Let's get a diversify your kit. Mistake number six that beginner filmmakers make is that they don't know how to be a storyteller. In the beginning, you're so focused on learning how to film and create a beautiful image, but you forget to develop your storytelling skills. The truth is there's no point in having a video that's just a bunch of beautiful shots. It's gotta have a story, a point to it. So how can you become a better storyteller? Well, first off, Becoming a better storyteller is a continual process. You're never gonna really arrive. So it's important to have that hunger to wanna keep learning and growing. But of course, there are practical steps you can take. For example, study the craft. Dive into the world of TV shows and films and other narrative mediums and see how is the director and the cinematographer using different aspects like cinematography and lighting and sound design in order to tell the story. As well, learn from other filmmakers. Try to network and meet other filmmakers in your area or if there's really great filmmakers out there that you would love to learn from them, watch interviews, buy their masterclasses, do whatever you can to learn from them and become a better storyteller. As well, learn to develop strong characters. Characters really drive the story and connect the audience emotionally. Invest time in developing relatable characters with clear motivations and conflicts. And show off character development and growth because ultimately that's going to really relate to your audience and connect them on a deeper level. And last, structure your story. You got to familiarize yourself with different storytelling structures like the three act structure or the hero's journey. While not every story needs to follow a specific formula, understanding these structures is going to help you create a really compelling story that's going to engage your audience from the beginning to end. Now these tips are only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to storytelling, but it's a start and you can continue continue the journey of learning how to become a storyteller from here on end. So the last and final mistake that beginner filmmakers make, number seven, is that they focus too much on their craft and not enough on the business. The unfortunate reality, even if you didn't sign up for it, the truth is that if you're gonna be a full-time videographer, content creator, you're most likely gonna have to start your own business and be an entrepreneur. And I know this is a little bit unfair because a lot of people who are creatives and who wanna be a full-time videographer don't necessarily wanna be a business owner, but it's just a part of the job. It's something that you gotta do. I think it's important to realize that running a business is actually not a bad thing and it actually can be a really great thing for you and provide a whole lot of freedom. For example, for me on this YouTube channel, by me owning my own business and being able to provide for myself financially, it's actually given me a lot of creative control and freedom because I can ultimately decide what kind of projects I work on, what kind of videos I can make. Whereas if I was working for an in-house company, I'd have a lot less control for what I'm creating because I'm ultimately under the rule of my boss and seniors and everyone else. So what are some tips for running a creative business? Well, tip number one is take the initiative. The truth is work is not gonna just fall in your lap, you have to go for it. So many people just end up sitting behind their computer waiting and hoping that some email comes to work for a certain brand or company, but that's just not gonna happen. You gotta take the initiative and show companies that you're serious and hungry and that you wanna work for them. And there's simple things that you can do to make that happen. For example, creating a spec ad, making a fake commercial. For example, if you wanna work for your favorite uh, sports team, you know, create a sports commercial, showing them what you could create and reach out to them and show what you've made. This is gonna show them that you are super passionate, you know what you're doing, and they're way more likely to hire you. Or start creating content and just tagging that company or brand on social media, showing them that you're super passionate about what they do, and eventually, you're gonna catch their eye and when you do reach out to them, they're gonna be much more likely to hire you. Or go one step further and research different brands and companies and come up with possible solutions for problems that you see they might be facing and when you reach out to that company offering solutions for their problems, they're gonna be really stoked about that and they're gonna to wanna to work with you. Tip number two, create content with a smile. And what I mean by this is that whenever you're creating content for a company, of course you wanna make the best possible photos and videos for them, but at the same time you wanna do it with a smile. And what I mean by this is that it's super important to create good content, but it's almost just as important to be a great person when you're on the job. So doing simple things like taking the time to get to know people's names, being personable, smiling, just creating a good work atmosphere is gonna make that company wanna work with you way more in the future rather than just by creating good content but you're being a total dick. Most likely they're never gonna reach out to you again because there's a whole bunch of other talented videographers who are great people. So you wanna make great content but with a smile. 
And these are simple things that you can do that aren't gonna cost you a thing, so you better make sure you're focusing on them while you're on the job. And tip number three on running a creative business, do not underestimate the power of having a great account and taking care of your taxes. Now I know whenever you hear the word taxes, it can create a lot of anxiety or just be super boring in your mind, but it's actually so important that you have a good account and you know all the ins and outs of doing taxes for your business because there's actually a lot of potential write-offs that you can save a whole bunch of taxes and get way bigger refunds. And as well, it's just important that this thing isn't nagging behind your back the whole time, you know, at the end of the month or end of the year, it's like, oh, tax season. It's better to be on top of things, having everything in order, your seats, everything organized, because then that thing isn't gonna stress you out and hinder your creative work. So don't ignore taxes. Don't be cheap and not get an accountant. Make sure you find someone who is really talented and passionate about what they do, because that's gonna free you up to do what you're passionate to do. That's right, folks. That's seven mistakes that beginner filmmakers make. I've made a lot of them and don't feel bad if you've made them because you can now make a decision to learn from those mistakes and grow and get better. And if you haven't made those mistakes, be wise and learn from people like me who have made those mistakes and don't repeat them yourself because that's the beauty of life. You don't actually have to make all the same mistakes yourself. You can just learn from other people and be a whole lot wiser. Anyways, hopefully this was helpful. If you are a beginner filmmaker and you're not yet subscribed to this channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button because I would love for you to see my future videos. We are out. Hopefully you've had a great day. I know I'm having a good day here, so see you next video. Thank you.